When the stock market crashed in 1929, America plunged into the period known as the Great Depression. In fact, not just America did, but the entire world plunged into the Great Depression. Now, our leader at the time is Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover is the one we turn to, that we're hoping is going to solve our problems and lead us out of the Great Depression. But as we said, Hoover has uh, his own opinions. He worked hard to get to where he was, and he doesn't believe in government handouts. He strongly believes in laissez-faire economics, letting business run itself and limiting the government. And these are not the answers for this time in our history. Hoover's initial attempt is going to be to ask big business to uh, just freeze wages, keep paying people, and continue producing. Pretend nothing has happened and uh, everything will right itself. Well, that isn't going to happen. They're losing money. They're not going to keep paying those wages. And, of course, when they cut people's wages and lay people off, well, then there'll be even less people with money to buy goods, which is going to be the business cycle in reverse now. He raises the tariff to try to protect American businesses with the highest tariff in American history, the uh, Holly Smoot tariff. But that backfires because everybody else jacks their prices up on us, too. Um, also, he uh, attempts to help the economy by cutting taxes and giving handouts to the rich. And this is, a, this is the same Republican approach to economics that you see throughout Republican history since the Civil War. When they want to stimulate the economy, the answer is, and sometimes it seems to work and sometimes it doesn't, to give the tax breaks or to give the bailout, give the money to the businesses. And the idea is the business will then have more money so then they will be able to hire more workers, and uh, then those workers will spend their money and buy more goods, and the business uh, cycle will start running the way we want it to. Uh, that trickle-down effect. But at this point in our history, in 1929, when we're, uh, we've hit rock bottom with the Great Depression here, it doesn't work. And it makes him look insensitive because there's people suffering, people starving, people who can't feed their families, and he's giving the government bailout to the rich. So that does not make people happy. And it gets worse. We're now up to 25% unemployment. That means one out of every four Americans that wants to work can't work. And even those that can work, well, quite often, they're not making enough wage to actually support their family. And Hoover doesn't believe in government handouts. He's not going to uh, directly give money to the poor because he believes that would undermine the moral fiber uh, by giving them a handout. And so he's against that. He's going to trust the local charities to do that if anyone's going to do it. And what you see now is people start to mock Hoover. They call the shanty towns that the poor uh, people who have lost their homes and are living in poverty in, they call them Hoovervilles. People uh, call the roadkill and the uh, rabbits and the possums and squirrels that they can kill to feed their families, they call those Hoover hogs. Down here in Texas, we have a special Hoover hog. Uh, the armadillo had just waddled its way up from South America. And so we were eating armadillos around here to keep people um, alive sometimes. And Hoover flags, well, that's your empty pockets pulled inside out, waving your Hoover flag, letting everyone see your pockets are empty. And so Hoover just doesn't look like he cares. Even though he cares very much, he believes that business will ride itself, but it's not happening. And at this point, right before his reelection, uh, something even more disastrous happens. The Bonus Army shows up. These are veterans from World War I who we had promised we would give a bonus to when they were elderly to help them through their old age. But they don't want to wait till they're elderly. They need their bonus now to feed their families. And so thousands of veterans show up in Washington to protest and to ask for their bonus early. Well, Hoover knows we can't afford to do that. And so after failing to answer their request, Hoover finally has to get these people out of the streets and he sent the United States Army under Douglas MacArthur, unfortunately. <laughs> MacArthur is a great military man. Military man. 
<laughs> he'll be great in the war, but he's not the man to send to deal with a crowd. And uh, he will use bayonets and tanks to drive these people out of the city. And then he will go right into their shanty town and drive them out of there, and people will be harmed and killed. And it's a public relations disaster that just makes Hoover look awful. Hoover wasn't going to win this election. I mean, they call them yellow dog Democrats down south, and this year the Democrats probably could have run a yellow dog and won the presidency. But they didn't run a yellow dog. They ran the perfect man for this job. They ran Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, Roosevelt, he's wealthy. He's from an upper-class family. He is a cousin of Teddy Roosevelt's. But his family has a tradition of uh, caring for, uh, about other Americans, uh, of, of being socially responsible and being active and trying to improve their communities. And, and he very much follows in the mold of his uh, cousin, even though Roosevelt had been a Republican and he was a Democrat. They shared a lot of progressive ideals. Roosevelt, he's an optimist, which is remarkable. The man, uh, today we say he had polio. Actually, some medical historians say it was probably something a little different, but people thought he had polio, and he didn't get it when he was a little kid. He had already run for vice president of the United States. He had a great life in front of him, and then he got struck down and became basically a cripple for the rest of his life. Although he could walk a few steps, he mostly spent his time in a wheelchair and was very weak, actually had to wear big heavy braces under his pants that could be locked in place to hold him up when he was giving a speech. And most of this was kept secret from the American people. The press back then actually covered for you in the, the political world. And so he could have given up on life, but instead he stayed optimistic. And that kind of optimism is what we needed. We needed a man who had a sunny disposition, who who believed we could overcome these problems. And he's famous for saying in his inaugural address, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And Roosevelt's going to be a remarkable president. He's not going to solve the Great Depression. Hoover didn't fix the Depression, but Hoover also didn't give us the impression that he was caring and was trying to save those that were suffering. Roosevelt's going to throw a lot of things at the Great Depression, and some will make things better, and some will not. But he's going to give the vast majority of the Americans the impression that he is trying. And that's going to be the biggest difference. One of the things he was remarkably good at was communication. See, there's this new medium back then called radio, and he's the first president to take advantage of it. He begins doing, on a regular basis, what were called at the time, fireside chats. The impression was he's sitting in his rocker by the fire in the White House, and he's just talking to you. And he would give addresses on the radio and explain his programs, not in some big fancy words, but in very plain, down-to-earth English, explain to you what his idea was, what the program was going to be, how it was supposed to help you. And it gave you the idea that he was interested, he cared about you. That was an important part of what made Roosevelt popular. When he became president, his brains trust. He picked the best people he could to run the different government agencies, even retaining some of the Republicans who were good with economics to try to uh, fix the economy. His program is going to be called the New Deal, and it's summed up by the three R's. He plans to implement relief, recovery, and reform. Now, first of all, we have to have relief, which is the part that Hoover had been missing out on. We've got to meet the needs of those who are suffering right now and trying to feed their families. We've got to help them. Then, we've got to help the economy recover. And once we fix the economy, then we need to make reforms, fix the problems in the system so that it never happens again. Now, as we look at these government programs that he comes up with and these uh, attempts that he makes to make the things better, be looking at those because uh, each one is at least meeting one of those three R's, if not more than one. It's either bringing relief, helping to recover the economy, or trying to reform the system. Now, in the next session of Congress, right after he becomes president, a lot of Democrats had swept into office too, 
and because people were blaming the Republicans for the disaster, which is often the way we do. Uh, whoever was in power, we blamed them for what went wrong. And uh, we have what's called the 100 Days, where for the first session of Congress, they pass bill after bill after bill uh, of his program to try to fix things. It was a remarkable period where Congress was very active trying to fix the problems. Some things are going to work. Some things will be terrible disasters. But you can't say they're not trying. Now, these are just a few of the programs that we're going to see. One thing they're going to do is the uh, Banking Act is going to close the banks. The banks were going bankrupt. People were coming and trying to draw their money out, runs on banks, and the banks were collapsing. And so they close the banks, give them a holiday, and for several days the banks have a chance to kind of collect their assets and get organized, and then the government allows the banks that can show they're solvent to reopen, and those that it's questionable, they stay closed longer. We try to put a stop on banks collapsing, and that one works pretty good. My very favorite program is the Civilian Conservation Corps. I like it because I like to do a lot of outdoor stuff, hiking and camping, and a lot of the facilities we have today were built by the CCC nearly a century ago. Now, the idea of the Civilian Conservation Corps is we're going to hire men to go build roads in the country, and they're going to plant trees, and they're going to build facilities in our national parks, and they're going to build campgrounds, and they're going to build a bunch of stuff that we just don't need. They're nice. We still use them today. I love them. But is that what we needed? What we needed were jobs. And that's what that was all about. We built stuff simply so the government would be able to create jobs that men could go off and make money to feed their families. That was the idea of the Civilian Conservation Corps. And men would, they would uh, be organized like in military units. They would leave their home states sometimes and they would go off, camp somewhere, do these construction projects, and they would send money home to their families. And this helped. The Federal Emergency Relief Act is kind of an urban version of the Civilian Conservation Corps. We're going to create jobs by building schools and parks and government buildings and bridges, things in city areas. Now, the NRA was one of Roosevelt's favorite ideas, and it's one of his most controversial. The idea of the NRA was that businesses would join and promise to pay fair wages and give good conditions to workers and, and set prices at a reasonable uh, price, it was they were agreeing to follow certain government regulations. Now, the problem with the NRA was conservatives thought it was too much government, and they hated it. Liberals thought it was too little government, and they hated it because it was a volunteer program, and you there was really no enforcement of it. So it ended up people both on the left and on the right criticized the NRA. Now, you see this little poster here. This is what you would put in your business to show you were a good American. Your business was with the NRA, and you're trying to help fix the problems. But pretty soon, the NRA kind of became a joke, and people wrote songs and poems about it, making fun of it. It didn't really help uh, in the end. Now, there were other areas where they came up with programs. A really good program was the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, back in uh, the back country of Appalachia, areas like uh, eastern Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, regions in this part of the country were still uh, without electrical power. And so on the Tennessee, in the Tennessee Valley, they started building dams to create power, which still powers this region of the country today, and, of course, it created a lot of jobs. This ends up being kind of a win-win situation. Now, another thing the government has to deal with during this time is uh, this thing called the Dust Bowl. Right when we're having all these economic problems, all of a sudden farmers got kicked, too. Um, all across the Great Plains, from the Panhandle of Texas up through Kansas and Nebraska and Oklahoma, you had dust storms that blew away all the topsoil and destroyed the crops. For three out of four years in the early 30s, our crops were devastated, and people, farmers couldn't pay their bills. 
they lost their farms and they loaded up in their vehicles and they went to Florida or to California to become migrant uh, harvesters in the uh, orchards out there. It was just devastating. The government, uh, through the Agricultural Adjustment Act, they addressed the Great Depression, they addressed the prices of farming goods, and they try to also address the Dust Bowl. And so uh, one thing they do is uh, to try to regulate the price of crops. They ended up paying farmers sometimes not to grow crops to, on certain goods to make the price where the people could make a living off of that product. And the government still does things like this. But they also step in when the Dust Bowl hits, and they start requiring, um, they start actually trying to plant some trees, plant some windbreaks. They come up with a uh, thing called terrace farming where they're able to uh, kind of stair-step your field instead of it being flat to prevent the wind from blowing away all of your uh, topsoil. And they actually managed to make some reforms which help prevent future disasters like this. Now, all of these programs are in his first administration. Uh, in the first couple of years of his administration, most of these programs come into effect. And as he continues on, we see other programs which are going to continue to make these uh, relief efforts, recovery efforts, and reform efforts. The WPA, the Works Progress Administration, is going to continue to create jobs like the CCC had done. Uh, and in this case, they create a lot of government jobs for unemployed people uh, in construction. They also, uh, if you notice this mural painted here, this is, a, this is art from that time period. They would pay artists to go out and create art. And this mural of people building a dam is painted on the side of the dam and <laughs> that they built. Uh, and if you go to old government buildings, downtown, post office, and uh, city halls, from that time period, you still see a lot of this uh, art from the WPA. And so they're paying people to do things. They're continuing to create jobs. Now, the Social Security Act was going to try to help out as well. Uh, for the first time, we're going to start to uh, have a government program to help the elderly. And so the idea of Social Security is everybody pays a little bit of money out of their paycheck which is going to be put aside to take care of them when they're old. And back then, the age was 55. Over the years, we have raised the age to 65, and quite frankly, uh, that's no longer sufficient. Um, if I want to get full retirement benefits, I'll have to work till I'm 70, and for some of you out there, it'll probably be even older than that. Our lifespans have increased. When they set the age at 55, the average American was dying at 53. So um, that was kind of problematic. They didn't expect to have to pay so many people. But now the amount of time that people can withdraw uh, money from Social Security has expanded to decades. My father's been retired for uh, about 20 years now, and he's still withdrawing Social Security. That wasn't what they intended. So they're going to have to figure out a fix for the program. But the idea was originally to help give money to the elderly to help uh, offset the Great Depression. The idea of the graduated income tax was meant to address the problem of uh, an imbalance in wealth distribution. Too much money was sitting in rich people's banks accounts and wasn't flowing through the economy. That was the concern. And so the idea was we're going to start taxing people based on how wealthy they are. Those that are suffering, the poorest among us, don't need to pay taxes or at least need a very greatly reduced tax rate to survive the Depression. So we're going to make their tax rate lower. People who make a little money will pay a little higher percentage, and then the people who make the most money will pay the biggest percentage. And so this is where we first have a graduated income tax, which has been controversial ever since, and we still debate whether it should be a flat tax and it should be an equal percent for everyone, or whether the wealthy should pay more. Well, these were all parts of his program early on. Now, in 1936, Roosevelt comes up for the first time for re-election, and he wins with the largest margin we had ever seen. He won big because people believed he cared. He hadn't fixed the Great Depression, but he was doing something. And some of it was working and some of it wasn't. 
but people had the opinion that he cared. And so he wins big. Now, after he wins big, he really makes his biggest political mistake in going after the Supreme Court. See, the Republican-packed Supreme Court didn't like a lot of the programs he was creating, and uh, so sometimes his programs would be challenged, they would be argued to the Supreme Court, and the court would rule them unconstitutional. So he wanted to uh, be able to put judges of his own on the court. Problem was, those old guys wouldn't die. They wouldn't leave the Supreme Court. They just kept sitting there, and he wanted to... Uh, expand the Supreme Court. He wanted to amend the Constitution to allow him to add more members to the Supreme Court. Um, and he fought and used his political capital, his popularity, to try to get this idea through, and he failed. And he wasted a lot of, uh, of his energy and popularity fighting this battle. And in the end, those guys eventually did retire or die, and he did eventually get to put some of his own people on the court. But that was probably his biggest mistake as uh, during the Depression was wasting some of his efforts on this. He continues his reform efforts, but the thing that's about to really make an impact on the Great Depression is coming, and there's no avoiding it. Overseas, as much as we want to be isolationist, over in Asia, Japan is growing in power. Over in Europe, Italy and Germany are becoming expansionists. And there's a world war coming. And America doesn't want to enter it. But Roosevelt sees it is coming. And he sees that he needs to start preparing America to be involved in this great world war. Because there will be no avoiding it. And so as we move towards the end of Roosevelt's second term of office, and towards his unprecedented third election, Roosevelt is trying to prepare the United States for the Second World War.